Hello, my name is Dr. Liran Rotem. I'm a faculty member here at the Technion at the Math Department. Today I'm very happy to be here to talk about my research in convex geometry. I had the pleasure of talking about it with Gilad, a PhD student here at the Technion. So please join us for the full conversation. Hello, Liran. My name is Gilad. I'm a PhD student at the faculty. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm good. So it's great to have you here. Can you maybe tell me a bit about your field of research? Yeah, sure. So I work in convex geometry, and convex geometry is what most people think about when they hear the word geometry. We really think about shapes in, let's say, R3, like balls and cubes and pyramids and cylinders, and they just have to be convex. Convex means that for every two points in the set, the entire segment that connects them belongs to the set. So all the sets I said before are convex, but for example, a heart shape is, is not convex. Because if you connect the two arcs, then you have to leave the set in order to get into it. Exactly. Okay, uh, can you maybe give an example of like a famous result from convex geometry? Uh, yes, yeah. so let me tell you a very old result, the isoperimetric inequality, which was known already to the Greeks. So I take a set, let's say convex, it doesn't have to be, and I look at its volume and its surface area. And let's assume I fix the volume to be one. And I want to know of all these sets of volume one, which set has the smallest possible surface area. So you can think about it as blowing a bubble with a fixed amount of air, and you want to know which shape the bubble will stabilize on, right? To minimize the surface tension. Exactly, because the amount of air I blow in is the volume. This is fixed. And the so bubble won't because of surface tension to minimize the surface area. So the answer would be a ball, right? Uh, yes, that's true. And this result is what is known as the isoperimetric inequality. Mm -hmm. And would you say that most results in convex geometry are just generalizations of this uh, isoperimetric inequality? Well, I don't know if most, definitely some. I mean, there are results, modern results, recent results, that are in some sense extensions of this very basic, very old fact. But definitely not all. Uh, for example, people care about sections of convex bodies. You take, say, a three-dimensional uh, set, and you cut it with a sharp knife, and you look at the two-dimensional section, and you want to know how it looks like. Or people care about packing. They give you two convex sets, and I want to pack as many copies of one into the other, like uh, packing oranges in a crate, for example. And there are many other directions people care about. So this sounds like very fundamental geometric questions. How did this field even develop? So exactly, because we talk about very old questions, some of them thousands of years old, a lot of it is very old uh, before we had the real notions of proofs and so on. But if you ask who developed uh, convex geometry as a real modern field of study, uh, this credit is probably due to Hermann Minkowski. He did it in the late 19th century. Minkowski is famous for many things, including his work on relativity, but he also worked in number theory, and he cared about the use of geometry in number theory, what is known as geometry of numbers. And this is probably where we can trace the origins of modern convex geometry. So you mentioned the isoperimetric inequality, and you said that it was uh known for a very long time. Can you maybe give an example of something a bit more modern, which is used in convex geometry? Uh, yeah, sure. So let me tell you about a result which is different in the sense that it's not really about convex sets in two dimension or in three dimension or in any fixed dimension. It really only makes sense when you talk about very, very large dimension, where we don't have very good geometric intuition. So as the dimension goes to infinity, Yes. Mm -hmm. This is known as the dvoretsky milman theorem. It was first proved by Arya Dvoretsky in the 60s, but the really influential proof was by Vitaly Milman in the 70s. And this is really a question about sections. So remember, we talked before about this idea of a section. So let me ask you, if I take, say, a cube, a three-dimensional cube, and I look at a two-dimensional section of this cube, how will it look like? Well. It probably depends on how you make the cut, right? It can be a square, it can be a hexagon, it can be all sorts of things. Uh, Why? Well, this is exactly true. I mean, we, there is no one answer. It really depends on the cut. But now let's go way up in dimension, and let's assume the cube is not three-dimensional, it's a million-dimensional, 
And you can even slightly increase the dimension of the cut, make it 10 dimensional instead of two dimensional. And I want to ask exactly the same question. But there's no way to visualize this, right? I, I cannot really visualize, at least easily, a 10 dimensional section of a million dimensional cube, but I can do the computations algebraically. I can just do them on a piece of paper. And the answer is that, well, the exact shape still depends on the cut, but with very, very high probability, if I pick the section at random in some sense, it will be almost a ball. What do you mean by almost a ball? Well, so the section cannot be exactly a ball, right? I take a section of a polytope, it will be a polytope, it will not be a ball. But it will be very close to a ball. It will be between two balls of almost the same radius. And this is only true for cubes, right? So actually, no. So oh. the surprising thing is that this is not a theorem about cubes. This is a theorem about high dimensional convex set. So let me treat a little bit in the statement of the theorem. But roughly the theorem says that if I take any convex body in high enough dimension, and I take a random cut of the random section of this convex body, with very high probability, this section will be almost a ball. That's really cool. So if I want to get into convex geometry, what sort of background do I need to get in order to understand the results? So the nice thing about convex geometry is that the questions tend to be pretty elementary. We gave two examples now, and at least the formulation is understandable, I think, to every undergraduate student. Mm -hmm. But the proofs are sometimes elementary, but often not. They can use very advanced tools for many areas, from analysis, from a probability, maybe from topology, maybe even from algebra sometimes, from combinatorics. And I think this is very nice that all these tools are used to prove something so elementary. And it also means that it's hard to know in advance exactly which tools will be useful for you. So the best advice is to just start getting into the field, read about the results you care about, and, you know, just be prepared that there will be some reading required along the way. Okay, so which of these tools do you actually use? So one of the things I'm really interested in is the relationship between convex geometry and analysis. So you take a function, say fxy equal e to minus x squared minus y squared. And, well, you worked with functions in the past, right? You know how to differentiate them, integrate them, and so on. Uh, but what I want to do is I want to treat them as a geometric object. You mean like a cube or a ball? Uh, yes, so, so exactly. I want to think about the functions, like the function I just told you about, like in some sense a generalized convex body, even though it looks nothing like a convex yeah. body. Mm -hmm. And what do you want to do with these functions? So all people do all kinds of things with them. Uh, the point is that it became pretty clear over the last couple of decades that even if you don't care about functions, I want to prove theorems about convex bodies, still working with those functions, with those generalized bodies, gives you the freedom to prove theorems, to prove results that are completely inaccessible if you try to only prove them in geometric uh, methods. So, for example, I'm interested in the surface area measure of a function. So what is this thing? So if for every convex body, I can associate some construction that is called the surface area measure of this body. And it doesn't really matter what it is right now. You may or may not remember exactly what the measure is. It doesn't matter exactly how I construct it. But this is some object. And what it does is it, it doesn't control the volume of the body, but it controls how the volume changes when I slightly deform the body. And I want to do the same for functions. I want to define the object, the measure, that will uh, measure how the integral of the function changes when I deform it a little bit. So this is something I know to do, and we know to prove some nice things about it, uh, but there are still a lot of open questions in this direction and in many other similar directions. Great. Can you maybe give a tip for graduate students who are just starting out? Uh, yeah, sure. So let me give a tip about picking an advisor. And my tip, I know it sounds a bit silly, is, is just pick someone. Just pick someone. So, so what do I mean by this? So probably not anyone. But, but when I was a master's student, I was a 
very worried about this decision because they took several courses I liked, many courses I liked, and the professors were nice, and it felt like a really big decision. How do you choose from all this field? And what I discovered later is that this is not such a big decision. I mean, I stayed in the same field after my master's, but I know many people who didn't, and it didn't hurt them in any way. So it's just not worth agonizing about. You should just think about the courses you took, choose a course where the material was interesting and the professor was nice, just schedule a meeting with this professor, ask him for a problem to think about. If it doesn't work out, you can move. It's really not something worth worrying too much about. Terrific. Uh, okay, then finally, can you maybe give me a fun math story from your own life? Uh, sure. So since we talked about choosing an advisor, let me tell you how I chose my advisor. So as I said, I took several courses and I didn't exactly know which field to choose. But one of these courses was in high dimensional convex geometry, like this dvoretsky milman theorem we talked about. Yeah. And I really like this course. So I scheduled a meeting with Vitaly Milman, the one from the, the theorem. The same Milman. The same Milman. Mm -hmm. I didn't know him too well. He didn't know me too well. Uh, but we still scheduled the meeting to talk about uh, the possibilities. Uh, we talked for about an hour, and near the end of this hour, he told me, you know, there was now a special semester that begins in Toronto, in Canada, about this field, and I will be there for the full semester. So if you want to be my student, you should let me know quickly so I can take you with me. And, you know, I was a young student, and this idea of going abroad for an all-expense-paid trip for a full semester... It sounds nice. It sounded nice. <laughs> So I said, well, sure, so I will tell, so I told him yes, and I started working uh, in convex geometry, and I stayed there for 12 years, so it's probably not a good tip for everyone how to choose their field, but at least for me it worked very well. It also wouldn't be the worst tip, I guess. Uh, great, so Liran, thank you so much for your time, it was great having you here. Uh, gladly, thanks for having me. Pleasure.